Hey legends, what's happening? This is Dan from the True Crown Grapple Podcast putting out a call to you to come over and give us a go. We're approaching our second year of doing this. We love what we do and you'll find a pretty solid product in a storytelling format, well researched and written with some cool music thrown in. We've got a webpage over at www.truecrime-grapple.captivate.fm where you can have access to all of our archives and all of our social media links are on there as well. We're also available to subscribe to on just about everywhere you listen to pods on. So check us out. That's the True Crime Grapple Podcast. And let us feed your morbid curiosity. A predator lures young men to his home and takes their lives. He stashes the bodies under the floorboards as his twisted version of roommates. Over five years, man after man enters the flat never to leave. What finally ends these gruesome crimes? This is the case of Dennis Nilsson. Hey listeners, I'm Hallie. And I'm Brittany. And thank you for jumping into the abyss with us today. We are very excited that you have joined us. We're going to be talking about a really interesting case based over in the UK. So it's going to be a little stretch from home and it'll be very interesting to talk about. Go ahead and follow us on social media, our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter account. They're all the Abyss Pod. You can also go subscribe to us on YouTube, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts, any of the outlets that you may be able to get updates on new episodes. Also, go ahead and give us a five-star ring if you like what you hear. And don't forget to check back in every other week for a new episode. So let's jump into the abyss. Dennis Nilsson was born November 23, 1945, in Fraserburgh, Scotland. His parents were Betty White and Olav Nilsson. Olav and Betty had a tumultuous relationship. Olav was often drunk and didn't really spend that much time with the family. And after about seven years, the couple separated. Dennis, his mother, and his two siblings went to live with his maternal grandfather, Andrew White. And Dennis and Andrew were extremely close. Andrew was a fisherman, but still spent a lot of time with Dennis. And Dennis thought of his grandfather as his best friend, his hero, his protector. But when Dennis was six, he went home to find his mother crying. He didn't really know what to make of it. And his mother asked if he wanted to see his grandfather. Dennis was really excited. He said, yes, of course he wanted to see his grandfather. And she directed him into the kitchen. Instead of seeing his grandfather sitting at the table or making food, Dennis saw a coffin. At the age of 62, his grandfather had suffered a heart attack at sea and had passed away. Young Dennis was devastated by this loss. And his mother tried to comfort him by telling him that his grandfather was in a better place. But all Dennis could think was, why didn't he take Dennis with him if he was going somewhere better? This event changed Dennis at his core. He later claimed that seeing the corpse of his grandfather was so traumatic that it led to huge psychological changes that put him in a really dark trajectory. Dennis started to pretend to drown as a way to feel close to his grandfather. When he was about eight, he did this at Inveralaki Beach, about four miles away from Fraserburg. Usually Dennis kept to shallow depths so he could stand up when he was ready. But this time the current was really strong and he was swept out to sea. He felt like this was his grandfather finally taking him to that better place and he almost drowned but was saved by an older boy and dragged back to shore. Shortly after this his family moved to Striken and his mother remarried a couple years later and went on to have four more children. With more kids in the house Dennis felt more alone and isolated because very little attention was placed on him. Around this time in his life Dennis became aware of his homosexual tendencies. He did not want to be labeled as gay, bisexual, or asexual. He really hated labels of any kind, and he hadn't been sexually active at that point. He did recall being sexually assaulted by an older boy earlier in his life and not hating it. And while this obviously doesn't necessarily indicate anything, he took it as evidence of his sexuality. He did not seem to exhibit the hallmarks of many serial killers. He didn't set fires. He showed no cruelty to animals. In fact, he loved animals. His mother recalled him helping wounded birds as a child. This is not to say he was quote-unquote normal in a developmental sense. 
He would watch young boys in his life as they slept and observe their bodies as they lay unconscious. And this would escalate as life went on. In 1961, Dennis Nilsson joined the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders in Inverness at the age of 16. He excelled in his exams and was a very intelligent young man. He became a butcher in the Army Catering Corps for the Queen's Royal Guard. Unbeknownst to anyone, these skills as a butcher would come in handy later in life for his monstrous activities. While working in the military, Dennis grew a passion for photography, specifically the control he could acquire through his photographs. He enjoyed picking a specific location, person, and what was happening in the photo. He was obsessed with perfecting the image he visualized. After a while, Dennis was assigned to a regiment in the Shetland Islands and was forced to relocate. Many people did not like Dennis and would make homosexual slurs to him. During his last few months of service in the Shetland Islands, Dennis met a man that he refers to as Terry. Terry was young and handsome, but was a heterosexual male. However, Dennis was able to get him to agree to pose in his photographs. He would have Terry and other willing participants pretend to be unconscious while he made home movies. Dennis fell in love with Terry, knowing that the feeling was most likely not mutual. When he left, Dennis felt extremely hurt. He damaged the films that he had made and returned the projector that he was borrowing. We have some home clips that Dennis made on our website for you to check out, but these aren't the clips with Terry and they're more just Dennis directing people and walking around different locations. In 1972, after 11 years of service, Dennis left the military. Keeping to what he felt he knew best, Dennis joined the Met Police Force two months after the end of his service. He realized during this time with the police that he was intrigued by autopsy bodies and looked forward to the morgue visits. Even though his new job fed into his guilty pleasures, he left the Met Police after about 8 to 10 months. He started on a new career path and became a recruitment interviewer. In 1973, a year after finishing his service in the military, an incident occurred with a man he brought back to his flat. The man's name was David Painter. Painter had met Dennis through work and they decided to spend some alone time together one night. Painter recalled waking up in the middle of the night to Dennis taking photos of him while he was asleep. This really spiked confusion and anxiety, causing him to hurt himself accidentally, and he was sent to the hospital. Dennis was brought in for questioning and was released without any charges. This may seem ludicrous, but this was in the 70s and Dennis had been a member of law enforcement and the military, so this possibly gave him an easy out. Dennis grew in his obsession with unconscious bodies. He started to pretend he had an unconscious body himself and would lay in front of the mirror motionless for hours on end. Dennis went to the extent of using makeup and fake blood to make himself look more dead. In November 1975, Dennis moved into a flat with a man named David Gallachin at 195 Melrose Avenue in North London. Gallachin and Dennis met one night when Gallachin was being bothered by two men. Dennis decided to step in and help him out. During their time in the flat, Dennis even adopted a dog named Bleep and a cat, and he felt that he had a romantic connection with Galachan. However, this romantic connection was not reciprocated. They had contradicting personalities and argued frequently. The stress of living in this environment pushed Dennis to his breaking point, and he ended up kicking Galachan out of their home. Even though it was Dennis's idea, he was still pretty devastated and started spiraling down into an alcoholic depression. He started inviting random men over to satisfy his loneliness and sexual desires, and 18 months after Galachan's departure, Dennis would commit his very first heinous crime. On December 29, 1978, Dennis met Steve Holmes at a pub. 14-year-old Steve was on his way home from a concert when he decided to stop into a pub for a drink. He and Dennis struck up a conversation that led to Dennis asking Steve back to his home. Although Steve was heterosexual, he agreed and ended up spending the night. In the morning, Dennis strangled him with a tie until he was unconscious. Dennis said, quote, I raised myself and slipped it on under his neck. I quickly straddled him and pulled tight for all I was worth. His body came alive immediately. We struggled off the bed onto the floor, end quote. Once Dennis noticed that Steve had passed out, he drowned him in a bucket. He said, quote, after a few minutes, the bubbles stopped coming. I lifted him up and set him on the armchair. The water was dripping from his short brown curly hair, end quote. Dennis then took Steve's body to the bathroom and cleaned it up. He placed the body on the bed and admired it. He later wrote, quote, it was the beginning of the end of my life as I had known it. I had started down an avenue of death and possession of a new kind of flatmate, end quote. So that's pretty gross, his interpretation of what had happened. It was like once he killed 
Steve, he just couldn't leave, so he had a built-in friend there. After cleaning the body, Dennis attempted intercourse with it, but was unsuccessful. He slept near the corpse that night, and the following day, he attempted to stash the body under the floorboards. Rigor mortis had set in at this point, making the body too rigid to easily fit in the space that he wanted it to, so he propped it against the wall and waited for rigor mortis to pass. The next day, the body was still too stiff, so Dennis laid the body down and worked to loosen it before putting it in the floorboards. Occasionally, he would take it out to bathe the corpse and then himself in the same water, and the body would end up staying there for the next seven months, after which he took the body out and burned it in his garden. In October 1979, almost a year after he murdered Steve Holmes, he attempted to strangle a young man during bondage play. Andrew Ho was a young student who went over to Dennis's home for intimacy. Andrew was into bondage and he really tried to convince Dennis to participate. However, he was strongly against his behavior and told him no repeatedly. Andrew wouldn't listen and continued to push him. Eventually, Dennis came at him with the bondage and attempts to strangle him and told him that he was playing a dangerous game. Andrew was horrified and fought off Dennis before fleeing to the police station. He told them about what had happened and no charges occurred against Dennis Nelson. On December 3rd, 1979, Dennis met a 23-year-old Canadian tourist named Kenneth Ockenden at a pub. The two hit it off and spent the day sightseeing and drinking, and they ended up back at Dennis's flat. Sometime in the night, Dennis strangled Kenneth with an electrical wire. He followed his same ritual as the previous murder, cleaning the body, sleeping near it, and he stored Kenneth in a wardrobe for a while and then under the floorboards, occasionally taking it out for acts of necrophilia and to take photos. He would even talk to Kenneth as if he were still alive. Five months later, Dennis struck again. On May 13th, 1980, he stumbled upon a man named Martin Duffy, who was 16 years old. Martin had run away from home and was sleeping at the Houston Railway Station. Dennis found Martin and offered to provide him with food at his flat. He was grateful for the kindness of a stranger, so he accepted the invitation. Once back at Dennis's flat, he ended up strangling Martin and drowned the young boy in the kitchen sink. He then proceeded to bathe the body and perform necrophilia. Later on, Martin would be placed under the floorboards with the other dead bodies. Around this time, Dennis came across a male sex worker, 27-year-old Bill Sutherland, one night while he was bar hopping. Dennis had no intention of taking this man home, but Bill followed him home, and Dennis ended up strangling him to death, saying later that he barely recalled actually killing Bill. He only remembered seeing his body the following day. Between September and October that year, Dennis recalled killing two individuals whose identities remain unknown. There was an individual who was an Irish man, about 25 years old, and Dennis didn't remember killing the man or much less about the incident itself. He said that he blacked out for a moment, then just remembered looking over and noticing the man was dead. On another occasion, he met a Mexican or Filipino man at a pub who was about 20 or 30 years old. Dennis's recollection of the incident is once again fuzzy. In November of 1980, Dennis invited barman Douglas Stewart back to his place. Douglas ended up falling asleep in a chair, and Dennis took this opportunity to try to strangle Douglas with a tie. When Douglas fought back, Dennis told him to leave. Douglas immediately reported this to police around 4 a.m., but the police dismissed the complaint since both men were intoxicated. They filed a report, but nothing ever came of it. The same month, Dennis recalled killing a homeless man he remembered as having bad teeth. He said he remembered killing this man and that he believed he was doing him a favor. In December of 1980, Dennis went on to murder another unidentified victim. The man was described as a hippie, and he was strangled and then placed underneath the floorboards. Dennis stated that it was a tight fit under the floor, so he took the man's body out later and dismembered it so it would fit better. The following month in January, Dennis killed another man who was Scottish and around 18 years old. They had met at the Gold Lion Pub and decided to go back to Dennis's place for a drinking contest. The man got so drunk that he passed out and Dennis then proceeded to strangle him to death. Since the space under the floorboards was already limited, making him dismember the last body, Dennis decided to go ahead and dismember this body as well and shoved it under the floor with the others like a puzzle piece. Within the upcoming months, Dennis murdered two more people. One was another Irishman who ran into him after the pubs closed, and the other individual was a man who he had met at a food cart. This man had a neck tattoo that had a dotted line with the words cut here. Dennis ended up strangling the man and dismembering his body, but he was in no rush to hide the body parts and only put them under the floor after they had sat out for a while. 
On September 18, 1981, Dennis came home to find a young man slumped over in his doorway. This man, 24-year-old Malcolm Barlow, was an orphan. He had physical disabilities, including epilepsy, that had left him weak. Dennis called an ambulance to come and help Malcolm, and the next day Malcolm went back to Dennis's flat to thank him for making the call to get Malcolm to the hospital. Dennis invited him in to talk and promptly strangled the man that he had saved only a day earlier. Because he already had so many bodies stashed around his flat, Dennis had to find new body-hiding real estate around his home. Dennis decided to store the body under the sink for the time being. By this time, having so many bodies decomposing was catching up to Dennis in terms of smell and flies, and he had to spray his whole flat down twice a day just to keep it at bay. He told neighbors that asked that the foul odor was coming from the building itself. Two months later, on November 23rd, Dennis was celebrating his birthday. He went out drinking and met a man named Paul Nobbs, who was 19 at the time. They started drinking together and ended up going back to Dennis's home. They drank some more until they eventually fell asleep. Paul woke up around 2.30 a.m. with an awful headache, imagining that it had to have been a really bad hangover and he was just coming off the alcohol. He went back to sleep in hopes of feeling better in the morning. Around 6 a.m., Paul woke up again and went into the kitchen. There was a mirror in the room and Paul happened to glance at himself and it looked like a stranger. He had dark red marks on his throat, bloodshot eyes, and his face was bruised. Dennis commented on his appearance, saying he should go to the doctor and get himself checked out, so that's exactly what he did. And the doctor told him that it appeared someone had tried to strangle him. Paul Nobbs was a little shaken up at this point, but he did not report anything. On New Year's of 1982, Dennis invited all his neighbors over for a party, but nobody could or wanted to come. Later, some neighbors saw him go out and come back with a young man, Toshimitsu Azawa. Later, neighbors heard commotion coming from Dennis's flat, and Toshimitsu fled the home crying. He told police that Dennis had come at him with a tie trying to kill him. Once again, police did not follow up on this claim. Later, Dennis claimed that he went into a kind of trance when he was killing, and that on seven occasions, he was able to snap out of it and let his victims go, including with Toshimitsu. This makes it seem like he was always in power, but in reality, it may have simply been that he was not able to overpower all of his victims and got scared when they fought back. He often came at his victims when they were intoxicated or unconscious and couldn't really defend themselves. Dennis said he contemplated suicide, but that seeing his dog changed his mind. He thought of himself as pretty clever, though. At one point, his home was vandalized, and Dennis called the police to come and investigate. They walked through his home, completely oblivious to the fact that there were bodies beneath the floor. One day, Dennis was approached by his landlord and offered money to move out of the apartment for a reason unrelated to Dennis's lifestyle choice, which Dennis agreed to. Along with packing up his belongings, Dennis was responsible for getting rid of the bodies that he had stored and all of the possible evidence that could link him to the murders. In order to remove the corpses from his home, he had a routine that he would follow. He performed necrophilic acts before dismembering the bodies, and then he would remove his clothes and dismember them on the kitchen floor with a large kitchen knife. Dennis stated that he would vomit sometimes during this procedure because of the smell and the maggots. He recalled there being so many maggots that he would have to brush them off of himself and swat away the flies. This is revolting, and I don't understand at all how any psychologically sound person would be okay with this. Dennis then boiled the skulls to remove the flesh and placed the organs in plastic bags to dispose of them. He buried limbs in his backyard and in the shed, and for the torsos, he would put them in suitcases and then burn them in a bonfire in the backyard. Dennis would burn these fires all day long for four days and raised no suspicion from neighbors. The children from nearby would even come and watch him at the bonfire, and Dennis would have to warn them not to get too close. After burning the bodies, he would crush up the remaining bones and scatter them about his yard. The move to a new location was something Dennis saw as an opportunity for change. He hoped that he would end his killing spree and put himself on a better path. He ended up getting a place at Cranley Gardens in North London. It was a top floor flat with no garden or removable floorboards, hoping that this would help him. He was able to hold off while he got settled into this new place, but by March of 1982, Dennis was back on the prowl. He ran into John Hallett at a pub. They had met previously at another pub and recognized each other, and they ended up going back to Dennis's home. John got into bed and refused to leave, and Dennis took a strip of upholstery and strangled John. 
Dennis was afraid that John would overpower him, so he attempted to knock him out before that could happen. And through the course of this attack, he got so nervous and shaky that he had to go into another room and collect himself. He then realized John was not dead and tried to strangle him again. When this didn't work, he dragged the body into the bathroom and drowned John. Because his new flat did not have the capacity to store bodies that his old one did, he had to become more creative with hiding his gruesome crimes. He decided to boil the heads, hands, and feet to get rid of the flesh off the bones, and he stored some body parts in a tea chest filled with salt. For other parts, he decided to strip the flesh, dissecting them into small pieces, and just flush them down the toilet. He did this over many days so he didn't clog the system. And any pieces that he couldn't flush or get rid of, he would just keep in garbage bags around his home. Two months after the attack on John, he brought home another victim. Carl's daughter was a drag queen that Dennis had met out late one night, and he invited him back into his new flat. Once back at the flat and ready for a good night's sleep, Carl got snuggled into bed. He was given a sleeping bag, and Dennis warned him to be careful with the zipper near his neck. Dennis was being sly because he knew what his intentions were. After Carl was snoozing, Dennis attempted to strangle him with the zipper of the sleeping bag by tightening it up around his neck. Carl woke up and thought that Dennis was helping him after the zipper may have acted up and gotten stuck, like Dennis had warned him. Dennis then took Carl to the bathroom in an attempt to drown him, which Carl thought he was just splashing him with water to try and wake him up. Once Carl seemed unresponsive, Dennis moved him out of the bathroom and he believed that Carl was dead. And supposedly, he tried to revive him for three days. When Carl finally regained consciousness, Dennis fabricated a story about Carl getting stuck in the sleeping bag and how Dennis was just trying to help him and how he even was trying to splash water on him to wake him up and to help him stay alert. And after this story, Carl felt truly lucky to be alive which he really was, but not for the same reason that he may be thinking. Carl thought everything was an awful nightmare, but a visit to the doctor told him that he had been severely strangled. Carl's daughter, like others, did not report the incident to the police. We have some audio of Carl talking about the event, and we'll let you guys hear that now. He um, warned me about getting into bed, but he had like a, a sleeping bag that was opened up like a duvet. And he said that I might get caught up in it. I woke up with a sleeping bag zip around my neck. It was really like digging into my neck, tearing into my neck. And as I put my hands up, at first I thought Nelson was trying to help me out of the zip. Um, and I think before I fell unconscious, I realized he was pulling tight out. Three months later, Carl was reading a horror novel, and something in the book ignited his true memories about the night with Dennis. He was in shock and horrified. Carl told his family and friends about the traumatic experience, and it was all brushed off as being this false memory. He was so confused and decided to go to multiple psychiatrists due to the realistic memories that he was having. He was told once again that they were just false memories, and he was even sent to counseling to reinforce this idea. Carl was placed on antidepressants, and he really started to believe what the professionals were telling him. Carl would not figure out that this happened to him until years later down the line, when Dennis finally wrote about the incident with the man and a sleeping bag zipper. In September of 1982, Dennis had Graham Allen over to his home. The two were eating omelets and Dennis claimed one minute everything was normal and then the next thing he knew, Graham was sitting there not moving with omelet hanging out of his mouth and red marks on his neck. He first thought that Graham had choked, but on seeing the red marks, he realized he actually must have strangled him without even being aware. He placed Graham's body in the bath for a few days before dissecting it and disposing of it the same way he did with John Hallett's body. Around this time, Dennis entered into a serious relationship with a man named Martin Craig. Martin was apparently totally unaware of his boyfriend's proclivities for killing and dismembering young men, and it didn't slow Dennis down at all. On January 26, 1983, Dennis came across 20-year-old Stephen Sinclair. Stephen was a drug addict and was homeless at the time, and Dennis bought him some food and invited him back to his home. Stephen agreed, and Stephen's friends saw him go off with this stranger and never return. Back at Dennis's home, the two listened to music, and Stephen shot up some drugs, and soon after, Stephen passed out. 
Once again, Dennis took advantage of the vulnerable position of his house guest, and he tied together a tie and some thick string and draped it over Stephen's knees. Dennis poured a drink and contemplated what he was about to do. He reasoned that he would be doing Stephen a service by putting him out of his misery and taking him from his troubled life, and he ended up convincing himself, framing it as a good deed. Dennis made sure that Stephen was asleep and strangled him. He then bathed the body and put it in bed, placing a mirror on each side so he could look at himself and Stephen naked together. He then proceeded with his disposal ritual. We had this detailed account, but some sources say that Dennis claimed he didn't remember this event at all. Almost two weeks after Dennis's last murder, the tenants at Cranley Garden started having problems. They had trouble getting their toilet to work and were unable to unclog it themselves. A plumber arrived to check out the problem, but the situation was going to require a specialist. Michael Cotran, a drain specialist with Dino Rod, ended up making his way into Cranley Gardens to help out the tenant. After analyzing the situation, he believed that it was going to be an underground issue and that he was going to have to enter the manhole to completely solve this problem. With the tenants all around, including Dennis, Michael went into the manhole and saw a sludge-like material. Upon closer inspection, he realized it was about 30 to 40 pieces of human flesh. Leaving the site, he told everyone that a complete investigation would need to be done the following morning, since it was already pretty late and getting dark outside. Dennis started to really panic about being caught for the first time in his criminal history. He went out that night and tried to remove as much human flesh from the drains and the manhole as he possibly could. A downstairs tenant ended up seeing Dennis coming out of the manhole all dirty, and it raised suspicion about his behavior. That evening, Dennis contemplated replacing the human flesh with raw chicken meat. But then that seemed pretty hopeless, and he contemplated suicide, but was unable to do it. Workers arrived the following morning to discover almost all of the flesh was gone. Luckily, they were still able to find one piece of human flesh, and they contacted law enforcement. After having the sample assessed by a pathologist, it was confirmed to be human flesh, and it had laceration marks. At this point, Dennis was completely aware of what was coming his way, and he knew it was only a matter of time. He even contacted a co-worker and said as a joke, quote, if I'm not in tomorrow, I'll either be ill, dead, or in jail, end quote. On the evening of February 9th, police went to Dennis's flat to question him. They knew that the flesh and the drains had to be coming from his flat. The layout of the drainage system meant that the drains containing the flesh could only come from an above ground floor, and the middle flat was empty, so that left only Dennis as the culprit. When officers walked in the flat, they noticed a pungent odor emanating and asked Dennis about it. I can only imagine, I know there's lots of smells people just become immune to and don't smell themselves. So I can only imagine how bad it was. And it made me think that Dennis was probably (laughs) had that smell kind of like coming from him all the time. And I don't know, it makes me wonder what his like neighbors and coworkers and stuff thought. Maybe that's why nobody wanted to come over for New Year's. <laughs> they asked Dennis about the smell, and he calmly told them that there were body parts stashed all over his home. He said he wanted to talk, and he knew his rights. They immediately arrested him, and against legal counsel, he confessed to killing 15 young men. He also admitted to seven attempted murders, although he could only remember the names of four of these. The more he talked, the more police realized how many opportunities they had had to investigate this man and how many times they had dropped the ball. His formal questioning went on over the following week and total over 30 hours, and we have some clips of that we're going to play for you now. In the end, it was when I was, say, two or three bodies under the, under the floorboard began to accumulate that uh, come the summer, it got hot, mm-hmm. and I knew it would be a smell problem. Yes. But uh, I thought, well, I'm going to have to deal with the smell problem. And I thought, what would cause the smell more than anything else? And I came to the conclusion it was the, the innards, the, the soft parts of the body, the yeah. organs and stuff like that. So on a weekend, I would sort of pull out the floorboards, and I find it totally unpleasant, and get blinding drunk so I could face it and start the section. Yeah on the kitchen floor. Mm-hmm. What's and I'd go, I'd go out and be sick outside in the gardens. I mean, what sort of, what sort of preparation would you have to make for that? You mean prepar- preparation? Well, I mean, if you were simply to bring these um, young men's bodies into your kitchen and start to dismember them, that's going to leave an awful mess. That so, doesn't leave a mess. Why should it leave a mess? Well, it could, couldn't it? 
No, it doesn't. It doesn't even matter. You see, it, when, when people in death situations where a knife is involved, and there's a lot of blood playing around. I'd love to stab you right now. You can stab me. The heart is pumping away then. There'll be blood splashing all over the place. Yeah. Funny enough, in a, in a dead body, there's no blood spurts or anything like that. It congeals inside and forms part of the, the flesh in there. It becomes like anything in a butcher shop. There's little or no blood. So you there's just, no there's no problem with... If you get a plastic... You know these uh, plastic bags that you have, dust yeah. in line, yeah. you slip one of those so it forms kind of a sheet. You... you the way he is talking in these videos, he's so nonchalant. He really just doesn't have any remorse or guilt for his actions. And he openly talks about it, not even wanting to preserve his face in publicity or any reason. Yeah, he talks about it like he's going to the grocery store or doing some mundane errand. But he's talking about ending the lives of people and dismembering them and like all kinds of horrible stuff. And he acts about it in a way that's procedural, like teaching a kid how to cut a circle out of a piece of paper, like super easy, super straightforward, like not a care in the world. While Dennis was in prison awaiting trial, he filled 50 notebooks with detailed accounts of his encounters and memories. He also sketched his victims and what they went through to assist the prosecution. Although he was forthcoming with details, he showed no remorse or guilt for what he had done, as you heard. He seemed excited to help the police collect information on him, and he told them to search his previous residence as well. There they found thousands of bone fragments in the garden from where Dennis had ground up the bones after he had burned them and scattered them around. Dennis said, quote, The victim is the dirty platter after the feast, and the washing up is an ordinary clinical task, end quote. Which is kind of the same thing as you were saying, is he just treated it as like a step-by-step no emotion just very cold yeah like we don't get emotional when we clean the dishes but to him that's the same thing as what he was doing yeah when an officer told dennis that he was a predator dennis responded with quote i see company first and hope everything will be all right end quote robert t moss was appointed as dennis lawyer and dennis ended up firing him rehiring him and firing him again all before the trial ultimately he hired a new lawyer ralph hames who had helped an inmate, David Martin, who Dennis happened to be in love with. On October 24th, 1983, Dennis Nilsson was charged on six counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder. Even though Dennis had confessed to everything, he still pled not guilty due to a mental defect. The courtroom was really dragged through the race with this case. Prosecution was forced to listen to interview notes from his arrest, which took over four hours to read verbatim to the jury. Testimonies were made by three witnesses who you will remember as victims who escaped Dennis's grasp, Paul Nobbs, Carl Stotter, and Douglas Stewart. When Douglas Stewart took the stand, he was questioned intensely. Dennis had told his lawyers that Douglas stayed after the supposed incident for a drink, clearly not feeling that he was as threatened as he's been saying. When this was addressed with Douglas, he was unable to explain himself. He also confessed to selling his story with embellishments to the press prior to the trial. So this ended up dismissing Douglas. However, Paul Nobbs and Carl Stodder testified that Dennis was friendly throughout the evening up until the event, but that didn't take away from what occurred and the lasting impacts of the incidents. To support Dennis's plea of mental defect, two psychiatrists took the stand in support of the defense. Their names were Dr. James McKeith and Dr. Patrick Galway. McKeith took the stand and stated that due to Dennis's childhood, lack of emotional expression, and the obvious divide between his mental function and actions, that Dennis was struggling with his identity and had impaired responsibility for his actions. After his statement, he was forced to retract the part about his impaired responsibility after an intense cross-examination. Dr. Patrick Galway was a second opportunity for the defense to be supported by a psychiatrist, and he took the stand and stated that Dennis had, quote, borderline false self as if pseudo normal narcissistic personality disorder, end quote, (laughs) but ultimately settled for false self syndrome. To me, it seems like they were just throwing words and trying to make them stick. (laughs) Yeah, he was just like, if I put enough words into this diagnosis, no one will question it. (laughs) The syndrome is noted by outbreaks of schizoid behavior, but nothing premeditated. Since Dennis had provided detailed testimonies, the judge questioned the integrity of Galway's diagnosis and 
ended up and ended up telling Galway he was using obtuse medical jargon and that it was going over the jury's heads. Finally, a psychiatrist named Dr. Paul Bowden took the stand to comment on the analysis that he made of Dennis Nilsson. He had spent a lot more time around Dennis compared to the other two psychiatrists, and Bowden completely rejected their analyses. He said that Dennis was manipulative and had signs of mental deficiency. However, he was coherent enough to know exactly what he had done when he had done it, and he was more than cognizant enough to accept full responsibility for his actions. Towards the end of the trial, the judge left the jury with one statement, quote, a mind can be evil without being abnormal, end quote. The jury was then released to discuss the verdict. And I feel like that judge's statement wraps up a lot of cases that people try to get certain insanity pleas and things like that. And sometimes it's necessary, but sometimes a person's just mean. Yeah. And you think about like for someone to do the things he did or just to kill anyone in such a gruesome way, there has to be something like different about their brain, but that doesn't mean that they're unable to understand that it's wrong or take responsibility for their actions or be punished for it. Not to mention that Dennis was hoping to change his killing spree and was aware of how wrong it was and aware that this was something he shouldn't be doing, but he still continued to pursue it anyway. Yeah, and even described a couple of times that he was doing was a service to his victim, that he was taking them out of a troubled life, which shows premeditation. And justification for himself. Yeah, so he definitely knew what he was doing before he did it, while he was doing it, and after he did it. The jury was not able to come to a unanimous decision, so on December 4th, 1983, the judge agreed to accept a majority rule. Based on this, Dennis was found guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. Dennis did not have a good time in prison. He was attacked with a razor, which resulted in injuries requiring 89 stitches to his face and chest. He was then moved to an area of the prison for high-risk inmates. In 1992, Dennis claimed that he had been lying about three of the victims that he had previously claimed to have killed. Police couldn't really confirm or deny this as they only had his word to go on. Many believed he just missed being in the spotlight and was grasping for attention, which I kind of tend to agree with because I just don't see the significance of taking away three of the victims. That doesn't really minimize his crimes, even if they aren't true. So it's not like he's denying everything. It was just three of them. So I don't really understand what he was hoping to gain from that, except for attention. Honestly, in my thoughts, too, he may have lied about even more of the unidentified people that he attacked. Maybe he just couldn't remember how much he actually lied about and had to like guess the number three that he was for sure about, but didn't want to overshoot it and seem like he was lying then. But who really knows except for him? Yeah, that does make sense. Some of the equipment that Dennis used to dismember and dispose of the bodies is on display at the Black Museum in Scotland Yard. On May 10th, 2018... Dennis was taken to the hospital for severe abdominal pain. He underwent an operation but suffered a blood clot, and he rejected the opportunity to stay in the hospital wing, so he was transported back to his cell. On May 12th, at the age of 72, Dennis Nelson suffered a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm and died lying in his own feces and, quote, deteriorating for two and a half hours, end quote. And that brings us to the end of Dennis Nilsson's case. I don't know about you guys, but it is definitely on our list now to go by the Black Museum in Scotland Yard and see some of the stuff on display. Supposedly, they have stuff on Jack the Ripper and obviously the stuff for Dennis Nilsson. And I think it would be really interesting. And we both really hope to go there someday. Thank you guys for tuning in with us today. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we hope you stay tuned in the next 14 days for our next episode don't forget to stay on track with the book club if you are a part of that right now we are reading the book the woman in cabin 10 it'll be going up on this friday so if you haven't finished the book go ahead and wrap it up and even shoot us some messages if you have any ideas and we can talk about it through facebook or any other of our platforms through email whichever way you decide to reach out go ahead and give us that five star rating and don't forget to check out our website theabysspod.com where you can see pictures from all of the cases we discuss 
and even check out some of our sources if you want to read up more on any of the crimes that we talk about. So thanks for jumping into the abyss with us. See you next time. His grand, grand, grand father, <laughs> grand father. <laughs> I can't talk. I just like they I were mean, probably bringing it up to him as a way to be like, oh my gosh, what is that smell? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, oh, these walls. Let me <laughs> tell like, you. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>